to uh, this week's Gastro uh, Echo meeting. The Gastro Echo is hosted by the Gastro Foundation in association with Project Echo from the University of New Mexico. These sessions, as you know, are held on a weekly basis. Today, we have registrations from 10 countries with 50 participants. And I'd like to welcome um, my friend, uh, Matteo Rosselli, who specialized in internal medicine at uh, Florence Medical University in 2011. During his specialization, he trained in hepatology and clinical ultrasound, developing a specific interest in hepatology and non-invasive assessment of liver disease, um, as well as for the management of the critically ill patient. He worked as a consultant physician in internal medicine, acute and emergency medicine until 2012. And then from 2013 to 2017, he worked at the Institute for Liver and Digestive Health, University College of London Royal Free Hospital, where he established his expertise and gained experience in interventional ultrasound. He is director and organizer of the International Hepatology Ultrasound course at UCL, Royal Free Hospital, and has been a lecturer at the Eurosun School and Easel uh, 2018, as well as a lecturer in various national and international uh, conferences worth worldwide, including our Gastro, um, Gastro Foundation Liver Interest Meeting at the end of 2019. He currently works as a consultant physician in, in internal medicine and clinical ultrasound in the high complexity unit of the Hospital of San Giuseppe in Empoli, Italy. He maintains an active academic collaboration with the University College of London, where since 2017, he holds a position of honorary associate professor for the Institute of Liver and Digestive Health. Welcome, Matteo, and looking forward to listening to your presentation as uh, the Gastro Foundation embarks on a uh, POCUS journey of our, cell, of our own. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fidel. Okay. Okay. Is it okay if I, I start with my presentation then, Fidel? Sorry. Please do. Me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Go ahead yeah. with your slides. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So thanks again um, for everybody for having me here again. It's an absolute pleasure. So in this uh, um, brief um, lecture, I will condensate the, the essence of, of uh, point of care ultrasound and gastroenterology. And uh, literally, yes, let's say in a nutshell, um, at the same time, nutshell is important and in gastroenterology because, and POCUS, because the sense of it is actually uh, focusing your clinical perspective in ultrasound and making a unique perspective, which is the, the, the main objective of using ultrasound in clinical practice. So a brief introduction in general, uh, telling you that it's very important when you use POCUS and ultrasound in general, that you have a clinical background, anatomical, physiological, and pathophysiological knowledge. So you need to be aware also of the sonographic transposition, both normal and anatomical, and also pathological findings. It's, it is crucial. What changes really is the use and the context uh, in which you use ultrasound. So uh, when you usually, as a clinician, use ultrasound, use the term echoscopia, which means literally to look uh, into with the use of ultrasound, which is a real sense of point of care ultrasound. Uh, it is usually a quick problem solving tool and uh, but it also can be used more thoroughly uh, as a, as a follow-up tool and it will I'll show you um, passing through uh, um, the following slides how to use POCUS through some examples in the gastrointestinal tract and also in liver disease. In general the indications and in digestion uh, tract disease me, are referred <laughs> Yes. You're not sharing at the moment your slides. It's, excuse me. You're not sharing your slides. They're not coming up. No, you have not shared yet. Would you like me to do it from this side? Let me see. Okay, it's coming up now. So, so far you haven't seen okay. anything, literally. Okay, here we are. Here we go. Good. We're all good. 
Okay. Okay, great. Sorry about that. So, um, mainly the indications in the, the digestive tract disease are pathology of the gastrointestinal tract as an inflammatory bowel disease and related complications, you know, plastic diseases and their complications, diverticulitis and the complications related to that because they have specific sonographic features as well as appendicitis and the complications and dysmotility disorders and obstruction and bowel obstruction with its related complications as well. When we look into bowel obstruction, we want to have, for example, an answer. Is the bowel, so is there bowel obstruction? Is the obstruction functional or mechanical? Is there ischemia or necrosis? Is there bowel perforation and free air in the, in the peritoneum? So all these um, questions, you can have an answer with ultrasound uh, and directly seeing through the patient with the ultrasound machines, which is absolutely um, uh, a, gaining, a gaining process. Let's have a look at the, uh, the, some features of the digestive tract and bounce immediately into, uh, into some uh, pathological features. Uh, normally, the bowel has a stratified appearance. And so when you look at the digestive tract disorders, you want to describe the stratification, basically, and the bowel motion. These are two, the two aspects that interface each other in different kinds of pathological conditions. The abnormality of the gastrointestinal tract it can in fact be characterized by marked wall thickening, accentuated stratification pattern, mainly of the submucosa, stratification of loss pattern, as it can happen, for example, in severe inflammation, ischemia, wall hematoma, but also some neoplasms. Transmural involvement, for example, in the Crohn's disease, TB, actinomycosis, diverticulitis as well, and neoplasm. Edema of the valvular conniventus is typically defined, for example, in venous thrombosis and exactly, or it can be reactive. In general, also you can have, for example, skipping areas of, of the involvement or the bowel element or the bowel wall, uh, for example, how it happens typically in Crohn's disease. Let's go and see closely what, what are some findings. In Crohn's disease, for example, the thickening of the bowel wall can typically be uh, affect some areas, skipping others, but you can see the thickening of the submucosa area with increased vascularized, uh, vascularization, which reflects the inflammation. This is a nice picture of how um, ultrasound shows a complicated Crohn's disease with an abscess-like uh, uh, an abscess-like area which fistulizes in the uh, rectum abdominis. This is well seen the fistula because there is air within the fistula itself. So it actually tracks, it's very well seen in ultrasound, very, very uh, specific and um, very sensitive and very specific, so extremely accurate. What about appendicitis? This is a normal appendix with a stratified normal layer, very thin, uh, nice and neat with a targeted appearance, but what, uh, when appendicitis th um, uh, takes place, there is a thickening and, they are, and the appendix is filled with the fluid. The diameter increases and sometimes it can also be perforated as it is shown here in this, uh, in this figure where there is, uh, the appendix has lost its differentiation of the stratifications and there is air that can see, be seen here like hyperechoic spots underneath, just underneath the peritoneum. An example of infective enterocolitis, uh, where we can see um, ill defined, very thick um, submucosal area, which is quite typical. Small bowel obstruction, we can see, for example, this is um, very distended bowel loops with, um, we cannot appreciate, obviously, the still, uh, still pictures, but eventually it is so useful to see in real motion because you can see the stasis of the, of the bowel content and the distended bowel loops. That is very, very, very specific. An ultrasound is an excellent technique to see that. What about malignancies of the gastrointestinal tract? For example, in the uh, gastric antrum, you can see here that there is a stenosis of the gastric antrum by this mass that is um, all around the gastric antrum and it, it picks up obviously the vascularized signal. It is very well seen as well. This uh, patient coming in uh, with um, fever, no abdominal pain, and uh, on the liver ultrasound, some hypoechoic areas were found. 
the uh, scan was extended to the whole abdomen and in the ascending colon, an ill-defined uh, mass was found with a hypocoic area here that you can see well, which is um, an, uh, an abscess, but the patient had um, I don't know, carcinoma of the colon, which had uh, infected and they had an abscess like fe um, fe with abscess like features. Sometimes you can have, let's say, paraphysiological alteration of bowel loops that are not strictly pathological, but are findings that need to be described. This is a patient with a nephrotic syndrome with extremely low levels of albumin. He's got ascites, and the bowel loops are quite thickened as well. So all these features are obviously very, um, very important, need to be described. There's a whole world in trying the gastrointestinal tract. So I, I just gave some flashes there, but there is a lot to be done and it is extremely useful, not only as a first diagnosis to integrate your clinical practice and to follow up patients, especially for example, patients with IBD is extremely useful, which have, can have flares of inflammation. And that is a moment in which you use a point of care ultrasound in the, in the clinical practice. Well, let's go jump into POCUS and hepatobiliary disease, because what we want to see, for example, in liver disease, it's also liver pathology uh, and diffuse liver disease, which can be acute and chronic, focal liver disease, biliary and vascular liver disease. I will not speak about liver transplantation because that would take an entire um, lecture on it by itself, but it's obviously point of care ultrasound in that context. In the first five days is extremely important, extremely useful. So there are questions that need to be uh, made and uh, answers to be given uh, when you use focus. So what you want to know, for example, a patient that comes in uh, with a, suspect, a suspected uh, liver dysfunction, are there any signs of diffuse disease? And if so, uh, is there chronic liver disease or are there acute features we usually don't have any specific findings? Is a patient with no advanced chronic liver disease and what's, what's happened to his liver function? Why is it going off? So does he have, for example, portal vein thrombosis? Has he got a bleary, um, a bleary obstruction? So all these questions you can answer with hepatobiliary focus. One of the most important and used um, applications is the differential diagnostic, diagnosis of jaundice. Is it a job obstructive jaundice, for example? Is it hepatocellular jaundice? Is it extrapatic? I Meaning, are there other causes that need to be excluded? Also, it's very important in prosperous general follow up, such as in liver biopsy, ERCP, after surgical intervention as well. So, regarding chronic liver disease, for example, what you want to show is some morphological changes. You will look for a regular outline, nodular regeneration, cardiac lobe hypertrophy, and size of portal hypertension. This is an example of fibrotic changes of chronic liver disease. You can see, for example, the margins are, are more rounded, and this is a quite wide and portal vein. And here you can see with a high frequency lena probe, the irregularity of the liver profile, which is a quite sensitive uh, marker of uh, advanced fibrosis. One is said, this is a case of decompensated liver disease. You can see very well the retracted liver uh, with the suspending ligaments floating in the acidic fluid, touching it to the uh, anterior abdominal wall. The gallbladder is thickened, and that needs to be taken into account because that is likely due to portal hypertension and low album levels. There's no signs or clinical signs of cholecystitis in this patient sternomegaly and also bowel oops floating between abundant um, abundant uh, acidic fluid. This is an interesting case that uh, happened to me literally five days ago. A uh, patient came in with a uh, distended uh, bowel. We had no history of liver disease, uh, but a history of, of heart failure. So I put my probe on the, um, on the abdomen and what you could see is grossly distended hepatic veins, a huge distended IVC, never saw such a distended IVC. This measured about five centimeters in width, uh, which was not moving with respirations, grossly um, uh, dilated uh, right-sided heart uh, sections and uh, pulsatile flow in both 
the hepatic veins and also in the portal vein. Portal vein is very important in this flow and it actually shows you, usually it's monophyletic or slightly biphasic. In this case, you can see that it's quite pulsatile and actually gets also inverted because of the increased central venous pressure, which increases postsynodial portal pressure uh, into the portal vein. This is a left um, portal uh, venous branch that connects basically with uh, a recognized uh, paraumbilical vein. It is very well seen here, uh, the nice um, portal systemic shunt, and, uh, and, and it's showed by a high frequency transducer. This patient also had splenomegaly, meg slightly splenomegaly, irregular control, thick and gallbladder, and you can see the outline of the liver was very, very irregular. We had a look also at the, again at the gallbladder. You can see there are a few stones here, but that was the least of his problems. Uh, and basically, this was a patient which uh, that came in with the standard, uh, the standard abdomen with a liver, liver, severe liver dysfunction due to um, acute cardiogenic liver injury because of heart failure. You can consider liver disease and hepatic hydrothorax uh, easily seen in this patient that came in again uh, with distended valve and shortness of breath. You can see this is the liver outline. It's very, very um, echogenic. You could, with a uh, posterior attenuation, you can barely see the portal vein here. And uh, you can very well see the diaphragm instead. And uh, below the diaphragm, you have a acidic fluid, and all around it on the other side, there's a large pleural effusion, as I was saying, that is compatible with hepatic hydrothorax in this patient that had acute on chronic um, liver failure secondary uh, to alcohol abuse. But sometimes the liver goes off because not because, or because or there is liver dysfunction by itself, but there are, can be extra hepatic causes. And here I wanted to share with you and draw your attention on this uh, patient that had a large pericardial effusion that was causing um, hepatic outflow obstruction and determining, therefore, uh, liver congestion. Uh, so sometimes you really need to look forward and focus on this really opens your perspectives to expand your, your examination. So basically tilting the report, subcostally, you can see very well the liver uh, on this, in this project, on this plane, nice and distended hepatic veins, right perifusion, atelectasic, uh, a, a lung, um, lung parenchyma, the pericardial fusion that I was telling you, and again, the pulsatile flow in the portal vein, as I mentioned before, because of increased post, uh, post portal pressure. One of the most um, common uh, used or uses of ultrasound is to exclude or diagnose um, goals in a patient that comes, for example, in with the right upper quadrant pain, sometimes accompanied by fever and uh, a cholestatic picture. Um, in this case, you, the, the gallstones are seen very nicely with as hyperechoic areas with the cast uh, posterior acoustic shadowing. And, uh, and in this case, as you, as you can see, there is, uh, for example, a um, gallstone in the CBD uh, that is very well seen also in MRCP as a filling defect. This is an interesting case, uh, also a few days ago, of, uh, uh, of a patient that came in uh, septic. Uh, the gallbladder has a very heterogeneous appearance. You can't see very well the lumen. Um, and what we did here uh, was to uh, immediately do, uh, we use that uh, a contrast and sound ultrasound that uses micro bubbles of sulfur exafluoride. And as you can see, the main concept is it's a pure blood pooling agent. So basically the, the contrast goes in the vascularized parts and you can see it, it enhances the outline of the gallbladder but also it defines the border of the gallbladder that has been perforated by the infective process. You wouldn't be able to see this in normal ultrasound. Obviously in a CT scan, yes, but here we are talking about point of care ultrasound and how to extend the bedside uh, examination and have an immediate and straightforward diagnosis. So the patient had gangrenous perforated cholecystitis. Obstructive jaundice is uh, another uh, important cause, uh, obviously, of uh, point of, uh, sorry, excuse me, point of care ultrasound is very, very good in uh, showing uh, and excluding eventually obstructive jaundice because 
the immediate features of the um, distended biliary, uh, biliary uh, system can be easily assessed uh, by ultrasound. As you can see, there is this uh, double barrel appearance that usually follows the portal venous system. And you can see on both sides here, it is enhanced by the fact that you also show on color Doppler the, the flow in the portal vein. And in this case, it is not shown, but it's clearly uh, distended and dilated. This is a case again of obstructed jaundice um, can, that can see very can be seen very well on this um, on this image where you have distended and dilated intrabiliary um, of the intrabiliary intrapatic tree. And uh, what, when we wanted to see the cause, um, we, did, we, we found that there was um, a cystic-like walled, walled off lesion at the head of at the level of the head of a pancreas. And, and the, the patient actually had a pancreatic pseudocyst that was compressing on the, uh, on the distal CBD, causing uh, intrapatic biliary dilatation. And that is, was literally seen in, uh, in, a, in a few minutes bedside as soon as the patient came on the ward. It is only about, not only about, I was saying diagnosis, but it's only also about follow-up. And this is a patient that came in, a young woman that came in with uh, um, portal vein, acute portal vein thrombosis. As you can see, there is a large clot in the main portal vein and the, also the right uh, branch of the portal vein. She was commenced on anticoagulation treatment. And you can see after a few days, there is actually some something is changing in the thrombus. You can see that this, there is this hypoechoic area here in the splenic vein that was also um, uh, affected by the by the thrombosis. And at day to twelve, there is still the thrombus, but things are radically changing, and it is slowly recanalizing. And she was doing well, so I was looking forward to see her again in the next few days to see how things go. But she's doing very well. Regarding post-procedural follow-up, as I was saying, liver biopsy, surgical intervention, and endoscopic procedures, especially post-ERCP, because what you want to see, for example, in post-ERCP is the presence of irabilia. You want to see that the stents is function uh, well and there are no complications. In this case, as a matter of fact, there was a complication. Uh, the complication was uh, biliary sepsis. He had patient had cholangitis and two um, abscesses that you can see here in this other major image that are sh shown very well, like hypochoic um, lesions within the hepatic parenchyma. And, uh, and you can very well see all the arabilia that is not specifically a pathological feature in general, as I said, if you undergo a spinterotomy or if you have, or if you put a biliary stent. As a matter of fact, it is a proof that is working well. But in this case, in this case, that there was um, a post post procedural infection and and the patient was was septic. Another case uh, of a patient that underwent um, an ultrasound guided liver biopsy that complained of abdominal pain after a few minutes from the procedure, and you can see that there is some uh, fluid around the the liver, but at the same time, after a few hours. The, um, there was also an echogenic layer between the, the liver surface and the peritoneum, meaning that there was some uh, the, there was a clotting process going ahead. The the um, the the the, the, aside, the fluid, like the blood, therefore, did not increase, and you can see it here very well. That actually decreased after after a few hours again, and the patient actually recovered. Didn't didn't need any further. Uh, any further imagine just observation and clinical and ultrasound follow-up. So in, as a conclusion, we can say that ultrasound can integrate clinical examination, and it's important in, um, in diagnostic information with a point of care approach, but also in follow-up is extremely, extremely important. The spectrum of application in gastroenterology and hepatology ranges from gastrointestinal tract to liver parenchymal pathology, and also splanchnic organs and vessels. And it's very important and useful to have a clinical ultrasound checklist, but also uh, it also is important to open your mind uh, because, um, because sometimes uh, diagnosis can expand and extend beyond liver and the gastrointestinal tract. And that is the, also the abuse of clinical examination and ultrasound can, can help you with that. Well, thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Matteo, for, for that presentation. Um, uh, I'd like to open the floor for any questions. Um, I think uh, Dr. Roselli has certainly uh, uh, displayed the utility of uh, point of care ultrasound as opposed to um, the clinician requesting an ultrasound and it being transferred down to another department. Um, Hello, I want to see. You me? There we go. Yeah. Can you? Um, thanks, Matteo. I think. Could we just start off by perhaps just explaining to our audience the advances technologically, technically in ultrasound? I mean, you know, many of our colleagues are not aware of the advances and how mobile the newer gadgets are. So perhaps, and, and Bill, you, you, you've got a lot of experience as well. Just if you could explain to us how portable these um, ultrasound examinations can be and the cost, for example, uh, is it affordable and can we roll it out in sub-Saharan Africa? Yes, so well, thank you very much for your question, Chris. So um, there, are, there is a vast range of, of uh, ultrasound machi uh, machines and, and, and gadgets um, that, that you, can, you can use. Um, for example, the, the machine that we, we use is, is quite, that has got different softwares as you can, as you saw, it has also the contrast enhanced ultrasound. It has quite a good definition. Uh, it is very portable and has, uh, has a good battery, which is on a practical point of view is good because sometimes you need to go from one place to another. You might very practically not have uh, a plug there or the here and there. So you want to have a machine that works. You, you want to go to the patient. You don't want to have the patient come to you. You want actually uh, to go to the patient. That is the usefulness also in, um, in, um, the, in different kind of scenarios which, in which you might um, operate. So um, I think point, the main um, thing in point of care ultrasound is uh, you don't need such a sophisticated machine to answer um, simple questions. So you need to target what, what level of ultrasound you want and what kind of answers you want to give. For example, a patient that has obstructive jaundice, for example, or, or comes with jaundice. So you want to give an answer, has he got bilateral dilatation? Hasn't he got bilateral dilatation? You don't need a huge high tech ultrasound machine to give that information. Um, and um, also portal vein turn. So there are, there are a range of, of conditions that you really can diagnose very, very, very easily uh, with that. In terms of, of costs, therefore, um, I don't know if you want me to mention some costs, but uh, I think- So, so Matteo, just hang on. We're talking about handheld modems, huh? using handheld modems and then using your either an iPad or your okay. phone as a screen, okay? Okay. I mean, that, that's really what we're focusing on. Is that right? Okay, so uh, I'll, uh, thanks for uh, specifying that. Yep. So um, th there are different um, gadgets uh, that are very good um, to do pocus. Absolutely, uh, the the cost is not uh, is, is not for, for the quality also of the images now is not very very high. You we speak. In terms of, I'll speak in, in terms of euros, approximately, we go, we range between 7,000, uh, from 5, 5 to 8,000 euros for, uh, for software. You have softwares that are built within the probe that you can connect, for example, to an iPad um, or a phone. Um, or other times, um, you, you do have the, the whole gadget, which is, comes with it also with a screen. So, um, but again, the, the price does not differ greatly. I think the most of it will be about 10,000 euros approximately. So affordable and they, they're, they're of good quality now. And also they do, some of them also do Doppler examination. So, so pretty good, to be honest. Chris, can I jump in? Yeah, of course. So, so, you know, um, in terms of what we ha have available in South Africa, firstly, we've got, um, uh, we, we've got probes that are now available in South Africa as low as 2,000 US dollars. 
these are from China. Uh, they do offer color Doppler and um, uh, have both linear and, and curved probes. Um, I, think, I think you are going to be trading off quality in terms of the um, uh, your screen and, and, and the pictures you require. But I think as Mateus pointed out, I think you need to have a checklist of what clinical questions you are likely to answer or to require um, uh, answering, for instance, do you want to look for the presence of ascites, which can be picked up relatively grossly um, in terms of doing procedures? Are you looking for obstructive jaundice? Um, or is it something a little bit more uh, 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 more um, high tech? And there, I think, if you're looking at inflammation of bowel wall, you'll probably need a slightly larger machine that isn't necessarily going to be handheld and may very well need uh, uh, to come around on a trolley in, in a ward setting. Um, Matteo, uh, am I correct with it's yeah, absolutely. Much. No, yeah, I agree. No, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I think for for directing your your questions uh, in in terms of, um, for example, uh, post procedural follow up, um, even to be honest, even in liver transplantations, to 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 uh, exclude uh, early complications, you you might it's they're pretty good because having color Doppler, mm -hmm. the, the, the some. Um, that's your checklist that you want to look at the hepatic artery, you want to look exclude uh, yep. pseudoaneurysm, you want to exclude a collection. So target it, ultrasound. You want to, to target that question, you want an answer straight away. And in that respect, yeah. these ultrasound machines help, handheld ultrasound machines are pretty good now. So, um, so yes, so, so. So, so Ernest has got but, an example um, yeah. uh, uh, below. P perhaps Ernest, do you, you want to just come in here since you've got an example there to show us? Yes, yeah, I'm... So Mateo. just uh, so, introduce yourself and... Uh, yeah. Yes, let me introduce you, Ernst. <laughs> so Ernst, Ernst Bossoff is one of our radiologists here at Fitz Donald Gordon, who's uh, um, been tasked with helping us gastroenterologists out um, on, on uh, the gecko radiology sessions, and we'll be pulling him on some of the focus stuff as well. Ernst, thanks for, thanks for joining up. Yeah, no, thanks, Matteo. I can see that um, you have a lot of experience with uh, ultrasound, and I think it takes a while for uh, the clinician to build up that type of experience. Um, I have an example of the portable probe, which is wireless. Um, these are the ones that we can quite uh, cheaply import from China. Yep. Um, they're not very expensive. They're wireless. They have a curvilinear probe. Um, this is what you'll use for, as you said, the deeper structures of the, the liver um, and the gallbladder, maybe the pancreas, and then the, the, flat curve, uh, the flat linear part, which you can use to look at the abdominal wall for hernias or maybe subcutaneous nodules and things like that. And this connects to your iPad. It charges wirelessly. Um, Obviously, it doesn't have the resolution, which is, just means that the picture aren't as, isn't as clear as the big ultrasound machines. But for the initial utility, I think especially for the basis of this whole um, webinar series, I think it's interesting for clinicians to maybe consider buying something like this and learning, le learn with it practically. Do a sonar on your own liver, See how it, see how you can change the settings because there is a learning curve of how you change the brightness and how you start interpreting the angle of how you hold the probe because it's so operator dependent. I think the last thing I want to say is uh, it's also a sonar is is interesting because it's an art mixed with a science. Whereas CT and MRI is pretty much a science. It uh, gets acquired very standardly, but sonar you are as intricately involved in diagnosing this, the, the patient as the patient is having the disease because you are holding the probe and you have to like manipulate it. So it's very important for the clinicians to maybe get the probe and practice with it. That's, that's, that's what I want to say, thanks. So just yeah. on that, sorry, uh, um, Bilal, but um, Matteo, I think it's very important here in our continent that we define very clearly how we want to use this modality. So for example, in inflammatory bowel disease, one of the big question is differentiating Crohn's from TB. I mean, that's a huge issue. That is really the most important issue from a diagnostic point of view. So do you think 
that we would be able to use this modality to answer a simple question like that. And, and I think what we've got to define is, is, is this in-out question that um, some uh, ultrasonographers have had experience in Sub-Saharan Africa. In other words, you're faced with a clinical question, you have got a modality here, is it present, is it not? It's got to be a very simple approach. Yeah. Do you think that this modality could be used to answer simple questions like that? Does the patient have hepatoma? Does he not? So the the definitely it will be able to uh, to show you to show you some 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 features. But the, the, for example, if you if you put in front uh, uh, um, in a in, like in Africa and a condition in which you might have intestinal TB, but the patient also can may have C, um, Crohn's disease, and there might be features that, I mean, sonographic features that may somehow overlap. You need to be extremely careful. Um, I remember speaking to a colleague of mine, Bilal. My 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 remember my remember him, uh, Tom Heller from uh, mm. Hamburg, so. Germany that, that uh, he was showing some very interesting uh, images of, of TB and also of with, with large lymph nodes, uh, the hepatic island. And if I would see them, for example, uh, in a, extracted from an endemic country where there is TB, I would think it's lymphoma um, for the way it appears. So, um, with that question in mind, we need to obviously the, 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 the epidemiological context in Africa is extremely important. Um, yes, sir, I can see a lesion, but ultrasound, uh, I mean, a, a focal lesion of the liver, but B mode ultrasound on its own would not be able to tell me if it's a benign or malignant lesion. And there are also, in 100%, I mean, because there, are, there might be lesions that look benign, but they're, and they're not. So that, I must be honest, I don't think B-mode ultrasound, maybe even very, very good machine, that it, it might be mistaken. So you need, for example, second level imaging for doing a differential between a benign and a malignant lesion. Uh, I definitely... Uh, uh, Excellent to see a biliary pathology. I think, yes, for biliary pathology, it would be great to see lymph nodes, but to know the nature of the lymph nodes, that might be tricky because of the endemic kind of disease that you have in Africa and the overlapping with others might be very difficult. Um, endemic diseases have, have, a, have a relevance, an absolute relevance. And there also is a specific protocol that has been, uh, that has been made that is called FASH, uh, protocol for tropical diseases in Africa specifically, and that includes TB as well. So that's, that's I think that should be borne in mind, absolutely. Um, so- Well, there are quite a few questions. Do you think we should- Yeah, I was, about, I was about to yeah. jump in. Can, uh, so Collins John, uh, I'm assuming from Nigeria is asking a question. Thanks, Mateo, I joined late, but just wondering about the utility of focus in children Size of the probe, sedation, etc. Thank you. Um, so uh, obviously, it depends how 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 old how old they are uh, in, in respect of sedation. Uh, I I, uh, I have been doing uh, uh, ultrasound in children, not in infants. I must be honest. Uh, so um, that might might be trickier. I, I, the idea of sedating them does. I don't like it uh, personally, but there might be situations in which it's tricky, uh, especially when there is a, a sick uh, child. So, uh, I, but I cannot answer that directly. And with regards to the to the cetacean and the approach, uh, definitely it's uh, it's a great tool to use, especially in children, because and I I do encourage the use of ultrasound because you don't there are no radiations. Um, and especially, I, I, I didn't have the space to mention that, but a contrast enhanced ultrasound, I know that mm. we are not talking about that, but, but now uh, that is, is absolutely unbelievably uh, accurate. Uh, and it is, I do encourage 
the use of it to reduce radiation expo exposure, for example, in children that might un need to undergo a CT scan, you can really, really spare lots of radiations. Uh, regarding the probes, you, um, you again, it depends how uh, old the child is. You may have pediatric probes as well, but uh, for example, you can use linear probes. So usually you are, if the, the, you don't have a pediat speci specified pediatric probe, then you can use uh, for example, a larger probe that has that actually goes quite deeper into the child, but it's quite small. So it depends really on age and and uh, and and settings. But I don't know if I managed to answer the question. Hmm. No, well done, Mateo. I think I, I do. I do, uh, I do definitely encourage the use of, of ultrasound in children. Absolutely, uh, it, it's a must. It's a must. Um, point of care and also advance because of the, the reasons I said, but yes. I think then uh, uh, an important comment from Stephen Krobler, uh, one of our senior gastroenterologists, is that focus may be definitive or indicate best next um, imaging, um, uh, next most appropriate imaging modality uh, and be used for target guided biopsies as well as a follow up tool. Um, and I think that's that's uh, just in terms of its clinical utility. Um, yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, so Ernst asked, you know, uh, Bilal, maybe we should just ask Matteo, you know, Ernst is asking, um, how long does it take to train? And um, do you need help from ultrasonographers? And do you need to confirm when you're training your initial findings with more definitive imaging such as CT, MRI. How did you train or how do you train? Maybe Ernst, you can come in. Well, I, I, I well, you never stop, you never stop learning an ultrasound, <laughs> but uh, um, it takes a while to, to be confident with what you see. And it's very important, for example, I started doing a, a course uh, organized by the Italian Society of Ultrasound Medicine and Biology. But having done that, then it was extremely important for me to be tutored by somebody that had experience. Uh, so I did the course and then I was, uh, I had a mentor uh, next to me. So, uh, because the findings are so, it is such a subjective kind of, of uh, technique that uh, sometimes uh, it is difficult, especially at the beginning, uh, to know if what you're seeing is exactly um, is compatible with the, with the underlying diagnosis. Um, one of the tricky parts of ultrasound is that small movements of your hand make huge differences on the image. So uh, again, you need to be tutored uh, well. Uh, I think, uh, at least the first six months, to be honest, uh, in a continuated way. Um, I did this course, it was about 300 hours uh, over three months. And then I was probably tutored um, by, a, by a very expert um, sonographer. So, so it takes, takes time, it takes time. Yes, yes, but, uh, and again, as, uh, Ernst was was mentioning it's really even you know taking time you can in some respect you can stay by yourself and use the probe uh, and and uh, work on your cord eye hand coordination but then after that you know you need somebody to confront yourself with what you have seen maybe take images and show them the images show them the case you you you've been working on so that's that's the beginning very very important. No, I, can, uh, I just want to add something. I think, um, I think it's a, it's a new, it's a completely new way of seeing the body. Whereas a clinician uh, examines the body from the outside, has a history, and looks at the blood results. Um, imaging looks inside the body, so you have to really know your anatomy. So, it, you have to know your basic normal anatomy, and then you need to know the variants, and then you need to know how the pathophysiology affects the anatomy, and then how it gets distorted. So it, it sounds very complex and it sounds very daunting, but I think a good starting point um, is if you have a patient with a disease that you already know what the disease is, the patient's had a CT scan or an MRI, 
and you know that there's a hepatoma in the liver, then you put the probe on the liver and then you can see there's a big mass in the liver and you can correlate it with the MRI and the CT scan. Even those things are difficult for clinicians to read initially because it's such a strange way of looking at the body. Instead of looking from the outside, you're looking on the inside and it's like axial and it's sagittal and you can, and the probe, you can change the plane of a probe to be horizontal, sagittal, coronal. Um, so it is a hands-on learning experience, but somebody needs to orientate you to the probe to let you know which side of the probe is left and right, which is one of the most basic things that you need to learn when you touch the probe in the first place. So there is there is initial basic thing that you need, somebody needs to show you how to do it. And it's not it's not always intuitive <laughs> like you would think it is. So we're running out of time. Uh, Prof. Shady, uh, you have a comment? Uh, thanks, Bilal. Um, Mattel, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation um, and showcasing all the wide range of indications uh, for COVID. Um, my question is this. So we, you've spoken a little bit about, you know, a liver lesion where this can tell you whether it's benign or malignant or whatever, and you still have to do a confirmation or gold standard test. My question is about cases where like a pseudocyst, a pancreatic pseudocyst, or like the patient that you showed with a portal vein thrombosis, where you're quite comfortable with the focus that this is what it is. In your practice, now that you've got a lot of experience, do you still go on to do a CT scan, for instance, or are you satisfied with that um, point of care diagnosis uh, from portal? I'm sorry that the, the, the voice was breaking up a lot. I'm not sure I understood the, the question. I, I heard about tell me if I understood well so if you see a portal vein thrombosis and a pseudocyst on point of care ultrasound am I happy with that or do I need further investigations is that is that correct yeah correct. that's yeah. the question is that what you're doing is that what you'd advise for us or for us because we're going to start out would you still say it's important for us to do additional tests not just for correlation so that we are comfortable with this, but also for clinical indication uh, Bilal, if I think maybe you can, um, you can relay my message. Thanks. Yep. Matea, I think you, I think you did understand the question. It's um, whether or not once you initiate, once you've made a diagnosis utilizing focus of, for instance, a portal vein thrombus, um, do you still go on in your clinical practice to order further investigations? No, no, absolutely yes, absolutely yes. This is the, the, the both examples, both patients underwent in that case, a CT scan. Um, the, the patient had also uh, involvement of the SMV. I could see the beginning of the thrombus that, uh, that was heading towards the SMV, but I want to have to see, or also I want to have a panoramic view in that case. So I would have that uh, also because, you know, uh, if a patient doesn't respond to um, respond to uh, anticoagulant treatment, there might be areas of bowel ischemia. I can see them with ultrasound, but a CT scan in that case gives me a more panoramic view. So yes, I did. The patient underwent, uh, and then she didn't go anymore, uh, undergo any more uh, CT scan. I've been following her with ultrasound. So once I'm sure that she's fine, she's responding. She had one CT scan no other CT scans and uh, all ultrasound. So in that respect, uh, the other patient uh, with a pancreatic pseudocyst as well, he underwent also CT scan after the, um, and the, uh, after that and also um, he went ultrasound um, through an echoendoscopy drainage of the pseudocyst. So, um, so th there are obviously, you want to have a panoramic view. But the good thing is that you immediately have your diagnosis, you suspect that, then you do have, if, if you think it is necessary, it was the second level imaging, and then you do your follow-up on ultrasound, unless there are clinical uh, yeah. obligations to have further imaging. Guys, um, I know uh, uh, Dr. Rosselli has to go, and he's already been generous um, with his time with us. Uh, Matteo, uh, I, I am right. I'm not. I'm not trying to. Yes, unfortunately, I, I, I need to run off. I'm. I'm, I'm so sorry. I need yeah. to leave. Uh, but no, 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 no. We we appreciate you coming. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ernst. I'm not sure if you want to uh, uh, stay on, Matteo.
thank you so much and we'll 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 release you i think we have another five minutes ten minutes of okay. this echo session to go well thank you again thanks, thanks, thank you thank you bye-bye bye -bye. uh i'm not sure if there are any further comments or questions uh so below i think we need to emphasize that um we can use gecko for a lot of the background information you know and in that we have a course actually that we we're going to be running at the end of well it's going to be in june july june. now june uh which is going to be hands-on but ernst um we can use a lot of a lot of the background information but clearly this is a hands-on training process i mean this is not something you can learn virtually no, I think you need to, I think the first thing you do realize is when you hold the probe, for instance, um, there's, because it's linear, there's a left and a right side. And when you put the probe on the patient, you have to orientate yourself to that so that you know which side you're looking on, on the monitor, which is left and which is right. So that you, you know, you don't make a basic mistake. Um, these are, these are basic things. People, people also differ in their anatomy. If you have a patient with COPD, they have very flat diaphragms, their liver might be down, their chest might be big, you might not see their liver because it's so subphrenic, people are fat, then you can't do sonars like you would just do. So it is a very hands-on thing that you have to practice and, and learn, some, learn the tricks of the trade, which you will learn from an experienced sonographer or, or, or radiologist. And I think um, if you get the probe, and you have a radiology service in your hospital, I can promise you the radiologists or the sonographers will be happy to show you the basic things of how to hold it and how to look at images. The most important thing is to, to get to know what normal structures look like. So if you get a probe, so know your family, so know your extended family, learn what normal looks like because what will happen and what I'm worried about is the more people do their own sonars, the focus, the point of case sonar, you will mistake normal anatomy for pathology. And that will lead to a lot of downstream investigations, which might be unnecessary. And I think, yeah, also Bayes' theorem, classical diagnostic philosophy of pretest probability. What is the chance of this disease existing in this patient? Then if you have a patient who have cirrhosis with an alpha fetal protein that's elevated, if there's a mass in the liver, statistically, that is going to be an HCC. You know, you, you know, you have to play the you have to play the clinical probabil probability game, and that's where Sonar will help you because it will confirm your suspicion. Um, it is, it is, it's, it. Uh, it might sound complicated, but I think there's a very short and quick learning curve here to make you at least comfortable by at looking at stuff and either confirming or excluding your your clinical um, diagnosis. Yeah, um, I think I think you know people playing with ultrasound without adequate training is is potentially a problem as well. Um, I mean, you know, uh, not 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 all lesions are HCCs. What about all the FNH, the the, um, the hepatic adenomas, etc. That um, uh, maybe picked up and then just focal fatty sparing that will be will, will, will you know is is becoming quite common and you know will will create unnecessary anxiety i think that what uh, chris in terms of our, our our plan for the training session is that we're also planning on bringing in individuals uh, existing sonographers from various uh, academic units to um to our session and we're trying to identify individuals who can act as mentors at various academic training sites in order to continue uh, training once individuals have completed the course and gone back um, back uh, back home. I think I think that there are a, a multitude of these weekend ultrasound courses. I'm not sure what you think of them, Ernst. Um, and and but you know as a start to potentially. Uh, for, for, for trainees to, to do one of those. And Stan, over to you. Uh, I, yeah, sorry, I just want to also add something. So you can do a course, but with the internet, I must say, YouTube is fantastic. There are lots of resources on, on YouTube where they will show you how to hold the probe, put the patient down, patient positioning, um, and it will show you 
all of these things that you might not be sure of. So I think it's important to do a course. And if you don't always remember what you've learned there, you can always just YouTube it um, or Google it. And it will show you, this is how you position the patient. This is how you look at the liver. This is what it looks like on the screen. So these are resources that are available there that are completely free that will uh, reinforce things that you've learned or that we speak about. And I think what's important, if the radiologist sends you a report with a lesion in the liver or the gallbladder, look at the images, like look at the film, start looking at the pictures to get an idea of, you know, what the internal structures look like. Yeah. Uh, Tim DeMeyer. Tim, you can go ahead with your question. Unmute yourself. Okay, sorry about well, that. You... Been doing this for a while, you know. <laughs> no, uh, I wanted to say that, that that's exactly how I learned is um, watch a few basic YouTube videos and know your limitations and then uh, scan lots and lots of kits. That's what, that's what we do. And um, we don't do any more uh, liver biopsies without visualizing the the liver and yeah it's uh, it's a steep learning curve but the only way you do it is actually by putting lots of probes on lots of patients uh steven um let's see rssa official opinion dead against short courses as accreditation form ultrasound uh, Stephen, what's the RSS Radiology Society? Is that is that right? Um, I don't know. That... I, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, I mean, accreditation is something completely different as opposed to focus. I think focus is focus yeah. on part of more of a clinical aid instead of being accredited. You're not going to put out the report of a sonar and then bill for it you're just going to use it as an adjunct to your clinical uh, examination. I think there's, a, I, think, yeah. I think competency, accreditation, I think these things are, are, are different. You know, you, you want to use something that you can base a clinical decision on. Uh, I don't know, I, 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 I'm just assuming, and then accreditation is more something formal where you are actually able to report sonars and put out official medical legal reports that other people act on. That, that would be my impression. Whereas focus is more like an immediate uh, problem solving tool. Hmm. I, I don't uh, know if this, this is think... going to make you accredited as a sonographer. I mean, sonographers trained for three years. Yeah, I think, I think um, you'd have to become pretty proficient before you can consider billing. There are billing codes for uh, non-radiologist sonographers uh, or sonography um, uh, that, I, that I'm aware of. Um, uh, and Stephen's uh, asking that same, how do you then afford an ultrasound machine if you're not able to bowl? But I think, I think in terms of specific for POCUS, you're looking at um, you know, uh, quick short answers and on a regular basis. I know, I know one, one area that we look at it uh, quite often and, and, and in that case, you simply can't bill because we, we, almost, we, we look at doing almost daily fluid assessments on our patients with hepatorenal, for instance, um, and trying to assess what their intravascular uh, fluid status is looking like, which I'm sure if we sent down to the radiology department, <laughs> yeah. we'd get quite upset. Yeah. No, please, please <laughs> perhaps we should regard POCUS as a very sophisticated and expensive uh, stethoscope. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, no, it's 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 fairly it's 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 focus is focused. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, you don't have to buy a big ultrasound machine, Stephen. You can buy a, a very inexpensive probe, you know, um, that will guide you. If 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 a diag if the radiologist makes a diagnosis of a portal vein thrombosis and you can see it with your focus, you can then follow that patient up with your focus until it resolves on anticoagulation. The benefit is completely for the patient. You might not be able to bill for that. There might be some clinical billing codes for using uh, specialized devices. I, I, I don't know from I don't know from a clinical point of view, but from a management point of view, it makes a big difference. Or you can just keep on sending yeah. the patient back to radiology, and we will check if there's a portal transfer. But 
I think that's what um, that's what you mentioned as well in one of your um, posts, uh, Stevens, where you said it's a, it's a good modality for follow up. So, you know, follow up. But I don't know about the billing. Yeah. Sorry. I think I think as as you become proficient with ultrasound, you can then add layers on. And then as Matteo has been talking about contrast enhanced ultrasonography, which I know we currently do not have the contrast available in this country. Once you've acquired a certain degree of proficiency, you can then start considering playing around with something like that. But I can see your face not looking too happy, Ernst. Yeah, no, no, it's a, that, I mean, that's a super specialized skill that, yeah. you know, it's something that you can learn, but I think, that would be like Matthias said. He spent three hundred hours learning sonar. That's that's a long time. That's a year. It's an hour a day for a year. Anyway, I'm optimistic. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's uh, just past half past five, guys. Thanks for the lively discussion. Uh, I hope uh, everyone else enjoyed it. Ernst, thank you so much as uh, for, for for joining us. Um, and uh, to everybody else uh, that uh, logged in from from all, all around uh, all around the world, thank you to the Echo University of New Mexico and Echo India team. Um, the feedback forms available in the chat. The recording is available on the Gastro Foundation website. Thanks again to the Gastro Foundation, Cheryl, Karen, to the presenters, and of course to our sponsors. See you guys next week for hepatocellular carcinoma with Ed Jonas um, uh, and, and Mark Benon, who are going to be talking about surgery for hepatocellular carcinoma and the management of hepatic carcinoma in Uganda with Dr. Michael Okello. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks a lot.